what I understand, you were part of the first uh, film school class at UCLA. Is that true? That is true. Uh, I had enrolled at UCLA in as a physics major and an astronomy minor because I wanted to be the first man on the moon mm -hmm. at that point. But after a year, I it became quite clear to me that the math was going to kill me. Mm. And so I changed my major to theater, or actually motion pictures. It was the first semester that the theater department had opened the motion picture branch. And at that point, it was kind of a shabby attempt. We were, you know, UCLA is this gorgeous, monumental brick school, and it was in temporary bungalows, you know, wood bungalows like a grammar school. But it was certainly the beginning of a great experiment. And you had access to equipment, uh, you could edit, you could um, sort of shoot your own films, is that...? Yes, but it was in the process of getting organized. Yeah. And it was actually just before the day of that miraculous moment where uh, everybody suddenly had a camera and everybody was suddenly a director, writer, movie maker with sync sound and the ability instead of uh, to, instead of writing a novel and keeping it in your trunk in the basement, making a movie and keeping it in your attic. <laughs> And uh, from what I understand, when you graduated from UCLA, um, you were making films for the United States military uh, during the Korean War? Yeah, when I was, I was drafted uh, and uh, went into the Air Force and they, I, because I had had some film background, they put me in a, in a unit that made movies, which didn't disappoint me at all. <laughs> and uh, we got to do training films, take pictures of forlorn soldiers and pictures of bridges and other interesting things. Mm. But uh, What did you uh, learn from that that you think you may have kind of carried on to when you kind of first started making uh, feature films? I think what I learned was basically that the uh, where the button you push is to turn the camera on <laughs> and you shouldn't forget to turn it off after you or somebody else says cut. But the, uh, of course, it's always a learning experience anytime you point a camera at anything. I think what I started to learn then became a, a uh, indelible lesson. And that's that it's not what you're pointing. It's what you're pointing at that counts. The piece of equipment will take the picture. If the subject is interesting, it'll be good. Yeah, especially um, sort of in documentary filmmaking when so much is happening around you and finding that perfect, uh, that perfect subject to film in the heat of the moment, especially sort of in a war setting. Yeah, but it also holds just as true in the uh, in dramatic or comedy film, in, in theatrical, because uh, you still start developing a instinct for where the audience would like to be while the scene takes place. At this moment, they'd like to be on his face. No, they might want to be in hers. No, they might want to be up here looking down. It's, uh, it becomes a very three-dimensional world and uh, you start learning to manipulate the geography. I went to work for, I, went, I had several jobs. Yeah. Uh, one profitable one was in sound. Mm -hmm. I became the uh, chief engineer at a recording studio and that was certainly paid off later on. And I became a photographer at a, um, a photo studio for portraits at a portrait studio that my wife hired me <laughs> as a photographer in, fortunately, because I doubt if anybody else would have. <laughs> but uh, they, uh, they were both pathetically stepping stones 
to the acquiring the knowledge. Then I went to work for an advertising agency and eventually quit the agency and opened up a production company, started making commercials for our ex clients at the advertising agency. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first commercial we made was for Howl Chevrolet. And it was a dog howling. Howl. Mm -hmm. It was uh, in animation. And in order to do that, we had to invent animation because I didn't know anything about it, really. Mm -hmm. But we did successfully do that commercial, except that, pathetically, the dog went, oh, 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 mm -hmm. oh. And in those days, they'd show commercials at the drive-in theaters. And to see your dog's head going, ooh, 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 on a big screen was disarming, mm -hmm. uh, disheartening, but it was a beginning. You sort of came up with the idea to do your own feature film, uh, which I really believe was too soon to love? Correct. That was the idea when I started. I knew that as soon as I had a script and the money, I would be directing only. Yeah. That was the aim. And finally, I, I had developed a script with a, a co-writer, a uh, Czechoslovakian novelist who was quite clever and old pro, who taught me a lot more than I learned at school mm -hmm. about writing uh, and the disciplines of writing screenplays and so on. And we had a screenplay that was ambitious and I liked quite a bit. And um, finally, after probably maybe a couple of years, I think certainly more than a year of scouting and, and scrounging, I found a man who would finance the picture. It was a black and white, low budget, wonder, 50,000 bucks. It was black and white, not out of artiness, but out of the fact I couldn't afford color. Yeah. And, uh, it was the day of the teenage exploitation film, and this was a teenage exploitation film about a subject that hadn't been done yet, about abortion. I was lucky when it came out. Uh, I managed to sell it to a major studio, the last one on the list, <laughs> and uh, they bought it for five times what I made it for. So the financier was happy, and the critics, perhaps it was a fortunate time, dubbed it as the first new wave American picture. Mm -hmm. The Nouvelle Vague had just become very popular here in America. With uh, Truffaut and uh, yeah. Dard. Exactly. And, and a couple of, of the major critics named this the first American new wave. So, with a combination of good money, I mean, good returns and, uh, and good critiques, I was able to direct movies for a living from that point forward. Uh, and that's when you got opportunities uh, to work for AIP or to do films that were sort of exactly. in that orbit. Yeah, and I became the best of the two dollar hookers. <laughs> <laughs> a big fish in a tiny pond. If you have three dollars, get somebody else. You only got two, see if you can get rushed. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, I still had, as I do now, delusions of grandeur about the films that I make. And I uh, uh, found it fascinating that because of the schedules we were making them on, they were 13 day films, because they were so fast in the turnover, you could actually work on topical subjects and still be valid by the time you hit the theaters. And so in a sense, I realized that I had a platform, if only I had something to say. And I find my, found myself developing things to say. Yeah. And the, uh, the parameters there were great because it was very low budget and you could kind of have the freedom to, um, you know, explore interesting subjects like Psych Out, for example, which is a really fun film. Jack Nicholson was the lead in that. Right. And uh, Susan Strasberg, and I kind of delved into the uh, Haight Ashbury yeah. uh, movement in San Francisco. And I was dying to do that picture. I was fascinated when the when the uh, the social phenomena hit of the hippies, a new culture, 
uh, make make love, not war, a nonviolent masculine hero. It was a, a rearrangement of a lot that was going on in the world, and I wanted to play with the theme. And they said they'd let me do it if uh, I would make a sequel to a very successful motorcycle picture I had made. Unfortunately, time had passed, and it had gone, grown cold in Haight-Asbury. Uh, the winter was more, you know, the, the warm summer had faded away, and the winter was hard on the kids that year. And uh, when they took one look at uh, our studio trucks, driving through the streets of San Francisco, we were immediately deemed the enemy. And some of the actors had, were getting threatened mm. by this nonviolent culture. Knives were being pulled and things like that. So I did something that was extremely difficult for me, morally, socially. I called up the Sonny Barger head of the Hells Angels and asked them to come and police the situation for us. Sort of like martial law in a sense. Or, right. Yeah. I looked like I was calling the Gestapo to <laughs> take care of the French underground, you know, <laughs> in a sense. But there was a real bond between uh, the Angels and the people in the street. They had dope in common. And that was a, a very friendly bond that they had. I never worked on Easy Rider. One day, Bert, the producer of the picture, who was the son of the head of the studio, he was a very smart guy and a very good filmmaker, came to me and said, Dick, I want to make a Richard Rush film. Can I borrow your three, your motorcycle trilogy, which is Hell's Angels, uh, Savage Seven, and Psych Out? I want to show them to my father and see if he, he could give me uh, Columbia Distribution. So I lent him the films and he hired my entire crew and a good part of my stock company of actors, which is Jack Nicholson, Sabrina Sharp, and a lot of the people I used. And he had a screening before they left for the location. It was a picture where they were in buses and they traveled around the country and worked from the buses. And before they left, they had a screening of my trilogy and he invited me. And afterwards he said, we're going to go make a Dick Rush film. And they came back with Easy Rider. Mm. And uh, I was uh, flattered mm -hmm. at you know, the fact that they gave me what that kind of... Uh, credit consideration in their minds. Yeah. I wasn't as pleased with the film then as I became with it later. Later they recut it and it became quite perfected and good. Initially it was more difficult, but uh, it was quite a brilliant attempt. And it was actually Jack Nicholson's brilliant phrase, I think, that made the picture his advertising phrase. And I went out to, to see America and I couldn't find it any place. Mm -hmm. okay. And you had a great collaboration with uh, Jack Nicholson, uh, especially at the very early part of his career. Uh, yeah. What was he like back then and how did you guys end up working on so many films together? Uh, we worked on so many because I kept trying to hire him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was so good. And uh, the first time I used him, I knew I had to use this guy again. Uh, he was a very nice kid and a brilliant actor with years of background at the actor's studio. So, you know, a very solid actor. And uh, um, because we were early in his career working together, I think a lot of his characteristics developed during that time. That famous Jack Nicholson laugh, that kind of shit-eating grin <laughs> that he's famous for were developed in those three pictures because I liked it very much and I kept saying, keep it, oh, please, let's have more of that. 
and it became part of his persona, I think. During that time, working on these uh, really low-budget films and uh, you know having a lot of kind of creative control to explore different subjects, uh, what did you learn from that that you eventually could sort of carry over when you were doing more uh, bigger studio projects? Everything. Everything about uh, what it takes to make a movie. The fact that you <laughs> have to literally create a world, people it with characters, and then somehow magically blow life into it. And there's a lot of technique involved in doing that, and a lot of art, hopefully, or it's just another dull, cheap movie. And uh, things were working out pretty well for me. All of, the pic all of my pictures were making money, and getting good reviews usually, uh, although not very noteworthy because they were small pictures, until I got a chance to make a studio picture. My first studio picture was for Columbia. I went in and argued with them that... Uh, what was that, getting straight? Getting straight, right. That uh, I was fiscally responsible mm -hmm. and uh, I make pictures cheaper than they do and I could do one for them successfully. And they took me on to write, produce, and direct Getting Straight, which was wonderful because when it came time to actually shoot it, I explained that my crew, which was a non-union crew, but one of the best crews in Hollywood, the only really good non-union crew in Hollywood, was Lasso Kovacs and company. Uh, and I taught the studio into fighting with the union to get them all into the union.